I just want to welcome all of you on behalf of Reverend Anna, who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight, um, the rest of our clergy, our congregation, the rest of our staff. This is such a beautiful space that we're in today, and it's a perfect October evening. So together we will pray with music, we will pray with spoken word, and most of all with our beloved community here. For so many people in Israel and in Gaza who have lost what we have right here in this very moment. When Rabbi Zach asked us if we could host this evening's program, we really didn't give it a second thought. We believe, as I'm sure you do, that whenever people of kind hearts are together in one space, be it in the same room or in the same virtual space, a little healing is brought into the world. Let's pray that some of the love that we have for each other tonight, right here and right now, floats out into the universe and lands on the people who need it the most. Thank you all for coming. Welcome, everybody. Um, we start most ceremonies with um, shaking so that we can release what's holding us back and, and be present for what is, and everybody's overwhelmed, and so uh, the physical and all that we can do to, to release out energy that's keeping us from the compassion that this moment calls for is essential. So if you'll breathe in with me like this. Exhale. Breathe in. Exhale. If you want to stand and jump around and shake is fine as well. Breathe in. Exhale. time, breathe in, exhale, find a more still place for your hands, either over your heart, in your lap, open, over your ears, breathe in, exhale, breathe in. Breath, breathe in. Exhale. Part of the problem with uh, processing uh, the horrors of the last weeks were that there haven't been a, enough community spaces. The, the vessel hasn't been big enough. What each of us is feeling is too much, and so we're all overwhelmed, and so I'm really grateful to be together in a space where the, the vessel of ceremony can hold what we can't hold individually. We are going to make some prayers. I will chant some of the prayers. We'll hear some poetry, and I have some words that I wrote this morning that I'd like to share. Yeah, but to be in the space of, of mourning and grieving, which um, I'll speak about later, but may be essential and that it's being skipped over. The, the, the grieving for every human being that dies is essential and we're, uh, people are being turned into numbers because the deaths are happening so fast. And, and so I wanna make a space for, for grieving and mourning so that we don't lose what's essential about that process that's demanded for every human being. Um, we're going to start with the Anabakoach, which is a very old, um, very, very old prayer um, written uh, around the year zero. It's chanted usually before Lechadodi, but um, 
almost three years ago, maybe just two years ago, I'm, I'm getting the date not exactly right, but uh, I, a friend of a friend of our community, a woman who I knew, um, she reached out to her friend who is a dear friend of ours, and she said, can you call Rabbi Zach? Um, Gaetano just died. Gaetano was um, about 19 years old. Um, and they weren't Jewish. They said, can you come and, and help with this moment for us? And I said, okay. And I helped as much as I could through the loss of Gaetano. And a day or two after, um, this, this melody came and came onto this prayer. And, and, and so, I, you know, we honor Gaetano's memory every time we sing this song, but also to, to remember that uh, so many of those killed and being killed are, are children. It's, and when a child dies, you know, my role has had me in that space more often than others are in that space. But the unspeakable horror of one child dying and, and, and how much that shatters families and community and, and and children being killed at this scale is unfathomable. I'm thrilled to have some musical companions, Rich Stein and Phil Mayer. We're going to play drums, and Yakuba Sissoko is going to play the kora. Um, some of my Thank 
At most of the funerals I preside over, I chant the, the prayer that I'm going to sing in a second. It's called El Mistater. It's written in 10 verses that correspond to uh, the, the 10 um, the centers of energy that are the Kabbalistic map of the world and the human being, the, the same map of, of the inside, the psycho-spiritual inside of a human being is the Kabbalist's map onto the human being and to God. And so we chant this prayer at the funeral because the soul is making a return to the place of soul from which it comes. And, and we imagine that the prayers that are made when someone dies help return the soul back to the source that it was birthed from. And we imagine that in that place of souls, there's no distinction 
between what kind of human being you were, what, what religion you might have been, what race you might have been, what anything you might have been. When the souls res return to the place of soul, there's, there's no distinctions anymore. And I, I worry that when souls die violently, that souls are affected and there's a specific uh, uh, additional prayers that are essential of, of, of when someone dies with violence around them that the soul needs more tending. And at, on the other hand, uh, you know, so many conversations this week in our home, you know, the other thought was that the angels run swiftly and the angels know how to take the soul with great swiftness so, so that there's not pain. I'm going to chant the Almistater for for those who have died, and the prayers are that the the transmigration of souls, the souls moving from this world to the next world, happens peacefully and with ease.
This is called Naturalized. It's by Hala Alian. Can I pull the land from me like a cork? I leak all over brunch. My father never learned to swim. I've already said too much. Look, the marigolds are coming in. Look, the cuties are watching vice again. Gloss and sound bites. They like to understand. They like to play devil's advocate. My father plays soccer. It's so hot in Gaza. No place for a child's braid under that hospital elevator. When this is over, when this is over, there is no over but quiet. Coworkers will congratulate me on the ceasefire and I will stretch my teeth into a country. As though I don't take Al Jazeera to the bath, as though I don't pray in broken Arabic. It's okay, they like me. They like me in a museum. They like me when I spit my father from my mouth. There's a whistle, there's a missile fist bumping the earth. I do a Pantene map on the shower curtain. I break a clonopin with my teeth and swim. The newspaper says truce and Seamart is selling pomegranate seeds again. Dumb metaphor, I ruined the dinner party. I was given a life, is it, frizzle, is it frivolous? Sundays are tarot days, Tuesdays are for tacos. There's a leak in the bathroom and I get it fixed in 30 minutes flat. All that spare water, all those numbers on the side of the screen. Here's your math, here's your hot take. That number isn't a number. That number is a first word, a nickname, a birthday song in June. I shouldn't have to tell you that. Here's your testimony, here's your beach vacation. Imagine I stop running when I'm tired. Imagine there's still the month of June. Tell me, what op-ed will grant the dead their dying? What editor, what red line, what pocket, what earth, what shake, what silence? Sonia. I 
think I, I think about the soul a lot. Um, I think the mystery of a human being to be a, a soul in a body or a body in a soul, maybe that's better language, the body is in the soul. The soul is not in the body. It really is false. I, I didn't, I didn't realize till now. But there's a teaching I have in mind that I, I won't, I won't speak. But it seems uh, the ethic of, the ethics of, not the ethics, the, the philosophies of war come from the instincts of the body. The body is the smaller of the two. Its in, instincts are baser. And the, the qualities, the capacities of the soul are where the ethic that we all wish to see in the world comes out of the soul, not out of the bodies, not out of tribal instinct. It comes out of trust and love. So I'm going to sing a prayer for the soul, and in the middle we'll have some poetry from one of my teachers read by Miss Denny Marsh, who is luckily in New York City tonight.
where it's all now Yeah, I don't tell dwelling within, clinging, souls with clarity, affection, every soul revealed, light drawn from its source, drawn into itself, drawn into the gardens of Eden, all souls praise God, the highest freedom, flight of Give the spirit its aspiration, all spirit, all action, all feeling, every moving thing. Inner revelation, central point of soul. Everything hidden within us, all of us. Thirst for the dew of the highest light. Deep calls out to deep, your water is boiling. Your waters are blessed, drink from them. Your wellsprings overflowing.
friend Mac is going to come read a poem. This is called The Interviewer Wants to Know About Fashion. A poem by Hala Alayani. Isn't it a miracle that they come back? They should go, as should the physical homes in which they raise the snakes. Otherwise, more snakes will be raised there. Ayelet Shaked. Think of all the calla lilies. Think of all the words that rhyme with calla. Isn't it a miracle that they come back? the flowers, the dead. I watch a woman bury her child. How? I lost a fetus and couldn't eat breakfast for a week. I watch a woman and the watching is a crime, so I return my eyes. The sea foams like a dog. What's 5,000 miles between friends? If you listen close enough, you can hear the earth crack like a neck. Be lucky. Try to make it to the morning.
try to find your heart in the newsprint, please, I'd rather be alive than holy. I don't have time to write about the soul. There are bodies to count. The news anchor says, oopsie. The prime minister says, thanks. There's a man wearing his wedding tuxedo to sleep in case. I meet God and there's a brick of light before each bombing. I dream I am a snake after all. I dream I do Jerusalem all over again. This time, I don't shake my hair down when the soldier tells me to. I don't thank them for my passport. Later, my grandfather says, they, could, they couldn't have kept it. You know that, don't you? I don't know what they couldn't do. I only know that enormous light, only that roar of nothing, as certain and incorrect as a sermon. I usually don't read from written page, read from written pages, but tonight I'm going to, and I scribbled or typed the words this morning, and uh, I've been sick for a couple days and, and overwhelmed, uh, so these were not read over a, a hundred times, maybe maybe two. <laughs> The violence of the last weeks, the horrors of the Hamas attacks on Israel, and the immediate response of the Israeli army, the siege and annihilation of Gaza, has crushed the hearts of all people whose being is tied up in that place. We are trembling in our bones. It is hard to see, to feel, to eat, sleep. It is difficult to breathe knowing human beings choose to do this to one another. I wonder what it would have been like for the Israeli army to pause after the horrific attacks of October 7th. Had the army paused, collected the dead in silence, tended to the wounded, the traumatized, those whose beloveds were violently killed, in silence, took time to gather the names of the kidnapped, gathered to mourn and attend burials before sending all of the soldiers to the front. How would that have changed the experience of those horrific events for Israelis, for Jews, for justice fighters the world over? To stop and internalize the lessons of grief and mourning. I imagine the pain, suffering, and brokenness of Israel would have been more clear. The rush to war covered over the lost and reminded those trying to make sense of this violence from the outside why the voice of justice must call the name of Palestine. To lose 1,400 Israelis in horrific violence and then to respond by terrorizing for weeks without end, to kill civilians and children the very thing which was so horrible and shocking, the very thing you are condemning in your enemy, their brutality. The Israeli army is showing its capacity for unfathomable cruelty each day that this continues. And by rushing to war, the humanity of the Israelis was lost. Their mourning, their grief, their horror is covered over by the willingness of the army to repeat the horrors Israel saw. 
Part of what is most important tonight is to remind ourselves the, the values to which we aspire, what it means to live and walk in goodness, righteousness, compassion. Each day as the image of a human being is desecrated by the history we are witnessing, we must remind ourselves of the values to which we aspire, justice, compassion, truth, mercy, kindness, love, peace, without condition. We are mourning all of the dead, no matter their place of birth, the language of their name, the name by which they refer to God, God who themselves is a reflection of the humanity to which we aspire. This is a very profound essay from Judith Butler called Precarious Life, The Powers of Mourning and Violence. Is there something to be gained from grieving, from tarrying with grief, from remaining exposed to its unbearability and not endeavoring to seek a resolution for grief through violence? Is there something to be gained in the political domain by maintaining grief as part of the framework within which we think our international ties? If we stay with the sense of lost, are we left feeling only passive and powerless as some might fear? Or are we rather returned to a sense of human vulnerability, to our re collective responsibility for the physical lives of one another? Could the experience of a dislocation of first world safety not condition the insight into the radically inequitable ways that corporeal vulnerability is distributed globally? To foreclose that vulnerability, to banish it, to make ourselves secure at the expense of every other human consideration is to eradicate one of the most important resources from which we must take our bearings and find our way to grieve and to make grief itself a resource for politics is not to be resigned to inaction, but it may be understood as the slow process by which we develop a point of identification with suffering itself. The disorientation of grief, who have I become, or indeed what is left of me, what is it in the other that I have lost, posits the I in the mode of unknowingness. One of the essential mentalities by which this degree of violence is allowed to continue is the dehumanization of people. We should be especially mindful of rhetoric, true or false, which is used for the sake of dehumanizing people. The Israeli dead are named as they should be. There are photos of them which accompany the name. The Israeli hostages are named. There are photos of them posted across the cities of the world. These are humanizing efforts to remind us that behind the number of hostages, there are people, individuals, a person with heart, love, fear, stolen from their families, trembling, unsure if they will live or die. But the Palestinian dead are not humanized in the same way. What are their names? the 5,000 who have been killed in only the first weeks of this annihilation? Where are their photos? What were the dreams of the prisoners of Gaza who yearned, as all human beings do, for goodness, for peace, for love, for accomplishment, for change? It was not something immediate, the act of lifting the veil, which uncovered the stories and mythologies of Israel, which I had been taught as a young American Jew an ideology of Zionism given over to all Jewish children, Israelis and Jews not living in Israel. In the earliest days of playing concerts with the Epichorus, our singer then, Al Sara, said to me at some point, Zach, I can't play any more gigs in synagogues with Israeli flags. And at the time, I wasn't even aware enough of outside perspectives to understand how the Israeli flag could be that offensive to another person. The atrocities of the state of Israel, the horrors committed in the, in the war of its founding, 
and even more importantly, the daily injustices of Palestinian life under the occupation are not explained in Hebrew school or on birthright trips to Israel. The wall which separates Israel from the West Bank and Israel from Gaza is accompanied by a wall of stories which selectively shares the beauties of Israel's people and their accomplishments and hides the stories of injustice which some claim is necessary to protect Israeli safety. Israel itself, as evidenced by the protest movements there in the last months, and the Jewish community outside of Israel, is in the midst of a tremendous shift. This is my tiny shred of hope. That enough of us are coming to recognize that you cannot brutalize another people into safety. You cannot ensure justice through an occupation wall. You cannot pretend you are living in peace while your neighbors are living in prison next door. Everyone bound in this story is connected to others who do not see it the same way. And so our choice to be emissaries of compassion and justice, to live those values in the center of our chests when there are onslaughts of pain, is essential to moving more of our human community out of the mindset of tribalism into the ethos of unabashed compassion that reverberates with every human heart that suffers at all times. This is a futile war, in quotes. Who really believes Hamas and ideology can be wiped out? Their leaders may be killed, their infrastructure may be destroyed, and how long will that last? One generation, two at most? And how much new hatred will have been sown in those who survive? And even if you believe that terror must be destroyed, at what cost? How many innocent Palestinians, mostly children, how many of their deaths are you willing to tolerate? Children whose humanity you have taken away by your willingness to make them numbers, acceptable consequences of war. 3,000, 5,000, 10,000. At one number, will you begin to agree that what we are witnessing is genocide? While the Israeli army destroys what was left of the prison of Gaza, and innocent Palestinians there live in unceasing terror, trembling in every moment, waiting for the death to come at a bomb from the sky or slowly beneath a crumbling building, politicians are told to be hush-hush about the word ceasefire. Give us a few more weeks, give us a few more months, the ground assault will be slow. Keep the word ceasefire out of the mouths of senators. Are you waiting for a number? At 20,000, will you be ready for a ceasefire? These are children, not terrorists. Skip the weeks of dehumanizing. They are being killed while we wait. The Israeli dead are dead. The terror of this war that was inflicted on children, the horror that Israel saw, they are giving it to countless more. The violence being perpetrated on the people of Gaza is unimaginably cruel and it is destroying the goodness of the Jewish people. It is a horrific stain on our tradition and the teachings of our ancestors, the moral demand of kindness to the stranger, the knowing that every single human being is an incarnation of God. To be a human being is to hold a soul, something boundless in a fragile, bounded body, a body of blood and skin easily fragmented. And the body grabs at the soul, stamps it with markers, squeezes it into boxes and labels and says, this is what you are. These are your people, these are your teachings. But the soul is wider than any vessel that could contain it. At the hour of birth, it was separated from a great pool of souls, all the souls of all the beings of all the world. And in that pool of soul, there was no distinction between tribe or people or birthright or language. There was only love, substance of togetherness, whose ethic knows that we are all responsible for one another. Our souls are shattering their holding vessel. And instead of fighting it, what if we release into it a breaking open of love of heart and soul that we have never known before. New souls, new bodies, a new ethic, new family, new hearts, new love. The 
ethos, the ethos of tribalism has reigned for all of human history until now. Those who have sacrificed all claim to preaching justice, love your neighbor as yourself, but not during the hour of war, not to people outside of our tribe. Has our moral compass not grown at all in 10,000 years? There must be a new way. We will not watch as human beings do this to one another and claim this is the only way. Cease fire. Stop killing and begin speaking. Negotiate the return of the hostages. Begin speaking of a political solution that ends the Israeli occupation of Palestine and lays the groundwork for a free Palestinian state beside the state of Israel. There is a constituency of souls yearning for justice, yearning for peace for all people. A constituency of souls who recognize the humanity of every child, who see in their eyes the possibility of what we can become if we allow love and her emissaries and ethic of the soul to become the material of our boundedness to one another. I picked one song for us to try and sing together. Um, I'll sing the first part, and then there's a kind of repeating chorus that the melody stays the same, but the, the words change out for shalom, salam, and, and let there be peace. So after you hear it, um, I hope you'll join us. Let there be peace. Let 
We're going to make the mourners Kaddish. Uh, please rise if you're able to. Gadal vid Kaddash mei rabah Bialma divrach rutei v'yamlich malchutei Chaychon, Vimechon, Chayed, Hobet, Israel, Bagala, Vizman, Kari, Vimru, Amen. Yehe Shme, Rabam, Varach, Leolam, Lalme, Almaya, Vit Barach, Vishtabach, Vit Paar, Vit Romam, Vit Nase, Vitadar, Vitale, Vitalal, Shme, Kudusha, Brihu, Laila, Minkol, Birchata, Vishirata, Tush, Bechata, Nechmata, Damiran, Bialma, Vimru, Amen. Hey Shlama Rabba Min Shemaya Vechaim Aleinu Vialko Israel Vimru Amen. Say Shalom Bim Romav, Huya Se Shalom Aleinu Vialko Israel Vialko Yoshvei Tevel Vimru Amen. going to conclude with another song of peace. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you um, Garnet and everyone at First Unitarian for joining us and being part of this vigil. Um, I think I've learned, I, I didn't know it, but just in the last years of how essential it is to carve the space of the heart with compassion and let it be so big and strong because this group who who is who has opened to this ethic even when the world is is continues to to try and live otherwise people move by the vibration of of each other they move by feeling your vibration less by what you say than by how you vibrate and so to be able to have your being certain of the extension of its compassion, big, big enough to hold little things that people are going to throw as they move through the process of, of worldviews crumbling. Can that space of compassion be so big that it can be a space for other people to move through? Can we be the vessels by which other people move through to this ethic that we need so direly right now?
Thank you, everybody, for joining us here in person and online. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Garnet. Thank you. For can you request a song? <laughs> sure. I don't know that we'll play it, but you can definitely request it. <laughs> I don't know John Lennon well enough to perform it, but if you want to come sing it, you are welcome. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. No, it's okay. Come sing. We'll be happy to hear it. <laughs>